you miss the biggest news of the week. The very first thing we're going to talk about in our dock here, and that is the, um, what are they calling it? Cloud bleed? Yes. Kind of like what they're calling it. Cloud. Yeah. So yeah. here we go. The original article here. Actually, if you don't mind pulling it up, I'm having a bit of an issue with my, uh, with my laptops. Oh, hold on. That might solve oh. it. Yep. Let's see if that works. Um, FNF4, very important. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay. So, oh, wait, do you have Cloud Bleed up? Um, I don't know. I don't think I do. I'm trying to. What's you, you got this. You got this. Just Cloud Bleed. Look at my incredible Bing skills. Wow, why are you using Bing? Because I opened. Why? Up. Why? Why do you? Why do you hate finding things, John? I'm kind of a masochist. <laughs> anyway. Okay, so cloud bleed is a big problem. It's like actually disastrous and uh, pretty much in a nutshell. Go. I got it, I got it, I got it. You got this? I got it, okay. I don't have my notes on it, so I'm going to sound like an idiot for a second until I pull up our internal thing. So pretty much what's happening is if you've logged into any... Cloudflare protected site. And so there's for, lots of those. Yeah, for those of you who aren't familiar with Cloudflare, basically it's like a, a DDoS mitigation mechanism that uh, websites, businesses, online services can use to make it more difficult for folks to DDoS them. So if you logged into any Cloudflare protected site or submitted any other sensitive information between, and this is like a fairly significant date range, the 22nd of September 2016 and the 18th of February 2017, there is a chance, it's a very small chance, but there's a chance that your password or that sensitive data may have been leaked. The bug was most severe between the 13th and 18th of February of this year, but even so, the chance of your data have been leaked is very low. With that said, security, 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 preventative security is better than reactionary security and what you guys need to do is go check out some of the resources shit 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 that exist right now about this and uh, change and update the passwords for the sites and services that you use that have been affected immediately like e immediately that's like the internet but faster almost 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 apparently this was this was reportedly caused by one incorrect character in I don't know how many how many lines of code and what essentially happened was my, my understanding is that it was a server memory dump so lord knows what was in the server memory of all these websites at any given time so this is why you should probably be going and changing your passwords if you have used any of these these affected services so even during the greatest period of impact uh so february 13th to 18th around one in every 3.3 million http requests through cloud fair flare potentially would have resulted in memory leakage so that's about 0.00003 percent of requests but with that in mind even that tiny percentage is potentially a huge problem and the reason for that is that even 0.00003 percent of the leaks from a mere 770 sites is 2.5 billion requests 
Internet's a big place. Yeah, internet's like, the internet's like huge. It's like, they have more tubes, the most tubes. The bigliest tubes. The bigliest tubes, so many tubes. Like you can't even, you can't even keep track of all the tubes it has. Um, so guys, go check it out. Um, let me just see. Yeah, there's a blog post over on Cloudflare. I'm gonna post that in the forum, or in the, in the forum. I'm gonna post that in the Twitch chat, so you guys can go check that out. Make sure that you're not, uh, not getting all your, you know, stuff ruined by having a bad day because people stole your information and whatnot. All right. Moving on. Shots fired. Google's Waymo sues Uber. So the original article here is from Ars Technica, and you will have to pull it up if you don't mind. Oh, yeah, there it is. Look at that. Way to go, Luke, Stream, Luke Screen Share. Um, alleging that they stole trade secrets. So Google named Anthony Lewandowski, once one of its top engineers, as the chief suspect in this case. Now, this is something that I've personally never really understood that well because while it's obvious that if you were to take like physical documents off of let's say you know a fellow a co-worker's desk and put them under your armpit or up your butt crack or wherever it is you decide to keep them and you waddle yourself over to another job interview <laughs> and kind of go just like that yeah if you like my face, you should see what happens when I turn around and pull my pants down. Um, you know, like, obviously, that would be considered uh, corporate espionage. And in this case, what they're alleging is that he installed specialized software on his corporate laptop, loading it with 14,000 confidential files about LiDAR technology, and that while he was at Google, he was secretly plotting this whole thing. His next startup, Auto, so they left Google in January, receiving a multi-million dollar severance, by the way. So it was like, here's a, some millions, buckets, of, here's some buckets of money. See you later, nice guy that we like. Then sold that startup in August. So it was like eight months later for 680 million to Uber. Then a month later, Uber unveils its plans to bring self-driving cars to Pittsburgh. So this looks pretty open and shut, but... Okay, explain to me what the difference is between putting corporate documents on a USB key up your butthole <laughs> and, you know, learning and um, developing as a person and as a professional and taking your, your job skills with you and the, the knowledge you've gained to a new employer. Okay, so full disclosure on this, yeah. I had maybe three weeks of trade secret law in law school, but here's what I can tell you. So there's possibly two issues. Was it the best three weeks of your life, though? It wasn't the worst three weeks of my life, so okay. well, there's that. I had a, I had a, I had a, I had a good, I had a good professor from the University of Kansas. Actually, I saw we had a Jayhawks fan somewhere on the Twitter, so or not Twitter, but Twitch chat. But uh, so there we go. Anyway, so a couple ways to look at this. So the guy we here was an ex Google employee. Yeah. So yes. one thing you can do obviously is when you hire someone, you can stick a confidentiality agreement in front of them, and you make them sign it as a condition of employment, and you can put in that confidentiality agreement. You can't do things like take sensitive dots, put them on USB drives, and jam them up, up your butthole. You can put that in the contract. So, so obviously, it's probably okay to jam it up his butthole as long as he doesn't then give it to anyone else. Probably. Okay. Yeah, I would. I would assume that their lawyers will be good enough to flush that particular detail out. But anyhow, <laughs> so and you know, obviously, this guy was obviously very, very important, and Google is a major company with plenty of money to hire good legal counsel. So he probably did, did this. But even if that never happened, and they hired him off the street, which I'm sure was not the case, but let's say they did this, and there was no confidentiality agreement, they said, he just told them, oh, you're hired, you start on Monday. Even so, um, trade secret law, my understanding is, yeah. again, because it has to be, if it's information that isn't publicly available, and there's some okay. sort of, like, possible real economic benefit or business benefit to that company, and they actually made efforts to protect it. Like Google wasn't being all loosey loosey with this information, but they were actually trying to protect it. Okay, so, so it's not like how to get yeah. to the bathroom on the second floor. Right, it's gotta be something that's not publicly known and might have some economic value. So as long as Google made reasonable efforts to protect that, then even if he had no agreement saying, you can't sell this stuff to competitors, then they could still go after him in court. Okay, so if, that's so, okay. Just and I'm just curious. And again, I'm probably digging in a little bit deeper than your three weeks 
might have covered we'll for, try me. for your correspondence law degree or whatever it is. No. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, no, I'm just kidding. Never well, I, well, I, well I, I ended up working here, so <laughs> it's kind of what it yeah. feels like sometimes. But <laughs> um, okay, but let me dig a little bit deeper. What if he didn't sell it? Now, in mm -hmm. this case, you can make a, a pretty, uh, pretty easy case for that he sold it because uh -huh. he went and started a company that clearly had this information and sold the company. Yeah. But what if he just gave it? Is that is that a different type of offense? Um, I don't know if it, as far as like type, I'm not even sure how to characterize that. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm almost completely certain you still can't do that. Like obviously, I think this there's some trade secret and some like patent stuff going on here. I'm not sure if they had a patent on this stuff or not, but. But if they, let's say, say there was a patent there, um, yeah. the patent actually excludes other people even from making your invention for a set period of time. Right. So but some things are notoriously so difficult to patent. They are, but the other part of that was, um, so this stuff looks more like trade secret than patent, right? Because, yeah. because a patents are publicly available. Like yeah. You can go and you can look at them, but you just can't make it or sell it. So, right. so, um, so to answer your question, I don't think the fact that he... The, the, if he didn't sell it, if, if, if he didn't sell this stuff, yeah. I don't think that would just completely get him off the hook. Right. So, yeah. And in this case, uh, I think it was N Fishin in Twitch chat pointed out that we're talking hypotheticals here. Google is a smart and together enough company that I pretty much guarantee you and it, large. every person who sets foot through that door has signed a piece of paper that says something about how you don't steal their stuff. Um, you know, let alone high-ranking engineers. So we, we get that, but N Fishin also pointed out that Usually, um, some kind of uh, what? the word has escaped me. It has been actually a very long week, folks. Um, the severance package that would be usually be accompanied by some kind of agreement as well. Like, here's some buckets of money. Um, you can't do these things for X amount of time yeah. after you leave. That yeah. would be fairly typical. So we're pretty sure Google has their butts covered here, and this is going to end up being a pretty uh, uncomfortable situation. But the other sort of possible outcome of this is that he's got so many hundreds of millions of dollars that it could end up dragged out in court for a very, very long time. Um, Nothing like lengthy litigation. So this is, this is a, a quote from the suit that apparently he took, this is a quote, extraordinary efforts to raid Waymo's design server and then conceal his activities. And they are alleging that his web searches, downloads, and access to an external drive left digital footprints that they plan to use to bring the suit against him. And you can also certainly use that stuff to say, oh, this dude knew what he was doing was wrong. That does not look good. All there right, so the original article here is from forums.overclocker.uk, and I'm going to get John to bring it up. Um, do you have the dock open? I can't get to it on this laptop. You can't get to the dock? You can't get to the dock? No, it's fine. Just give me one second. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to do this, guys. It's going to be okay. We're going to do this the old-fashioned way, but we're going to do this the iPhone 1 way. No copy-paste. You just... If you want to do it, just do it. Hold if on. If you want to get something, here we go. Here we go. Gotta, is this it? Is this it? Do we have it? Do we have it? Do we have it? I think that's it. Hey, we got it. Okay. Okay. So first things first, I want to give you guys the AMD Ryzen summary. Have a little bit of discussion here, and then we're going to talk about already prior to launch. And I don't have mine yet. Uh, the pictures that I took were of one at the event. I didn't bring that with me. Um, but uh, we're going to talk about rumors already surfacing that there might be some issues. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so step one of this is Ryzen's coming, okay? I actually don't know if the, uh, yes, I, so, okay, so it's a, for pre-order now, and the ship date is March 2nd, okay? So Ryzen's coming. That's super exciting. We're all super amped up on that. There are three SKUs that they're announcing right now, all in the Ryzen 7 lineup. Have you looked into this much? A little bit. Okay. So there's the top of the line 1800X. That one is clocked at, I think it's uh, 3.6 to 4 gigahertz. And it's an 8-core, 16-thread processor. There's the 1700X, which is 3.4 to 3.8. If I recall correctly, and then there's the seven. Did I say X that time? You did. Okay. Then there's the 1700 non X. Um, that tall shot at like 3.7. Yeah. So that one's like three to 3.7. Yeah. 
They're priced anywhere from $4.99 down to $3.99 down to $3.29. So what's really cool about this is that AMD has taken eight threads or eight cores, 16 threads, and gone, you know what? This is worth 500 bucks tops. And you can have this for as little as Intel was spent as was asking for a 7700K, which is four cores, 16 threads, and onboard graphics. Oh. Uh, well, and we can we can discuss that a little bit later as well, actually. And uh, yeah, I mean it's got support for DDR4, 24 PCIe lanes, which is smack in the middle of Intel's high-end platform. And, AM, and Intel's low-end platform, their mainstream platform. Um, and performance looks really, really impressive. Now, to be clear, there are some things that apparently I misspoke on something. Obviously, when I was talking about the Intel chip, I meant four cores, eight threads, okay? <laughs> chill. I, I, I misspoke on something else recently. People were like, Woo! Oh, yeah, we'll get the pitch forks out already. Uh, yeah, right. Anyway, so you are actually making some trade-offs. Let's say that Ryzen's performance per clock, per core, was identical to Intel Broadwell or Skylake or KB Lake or whatever the case may be. I, I haven't personally tested it, so I can't break an embargo for information I don't have. Let's say, for example, it was, it was identical. You are still making some trade-offs. Intel does have exclusive technologies. They have Thunderbolt 3. They have the upcoming Optane, which I don't know really a whole lot about. John has done a fair bit of research. <laughs> Actually, you have done a fair bit of research. Do you want to talk about what's Optane in a nutshell? TLDR, uh, extremely fast SSDs, like quite a bit faster than uh, PCI Express M.2. Okay. Yeah. Cool. D should we should we talk more about that? Or? No, that's fine. So okay. so Intel does have exclusive technologies. They do potentially have optimizations and functional units available in their CPUs that AMD might not have. So a perfect example of that would be the onboard GPU. So that GPU can do things like one of the demos that AMD has been running to show how more cores can benefit real users today has been gaming, playing Dota 2 while streaming. And they've demonstrated that a 7700K gets absolutely butt-wrecked by that scenario, dropping something like 20% of the frames while the game streams. Yeah, like pretty significant, like 15 to 20%. However, what AMD conveniently doesn't demonstrate is that you could stream using Intel QuickSync video, in which case you would be offloading that encoding task to the onboard GPU. Now, the argument AMD makes is that at the kinds of bit rates that you're able to use when you're streaming to Twitch, so typically around 3,500 kilobit per second, you are, it is very important to have the cleanest possible source because any blocking or artifacting that exists in the original source at that kind of a bit rate at 1080p60 or like 900p60, which is again, fairly typical for Twitch, is exacerbated. It is made much worse by the low bitrate stream over Twitch's service. So they make the argument that more cores is in this case more important than having that fixed function video encoder. So there you go. Basically the, the fight that's coming is pretty interesting. AMD's saying, you know what? Forget about it with some of this other stuff that we're, we're going high performance CPU. I mean, that was right on the, it was right on Dr. Sue's deck. And Intel has taken a completely different strategy over the last few years, increasing their per core performance and their core counts on the mainstream, basically not at all in several generations and adding more and more GPU performance in that iGPU. I forget where I was going with this. A little different than how it used to be, almost almost opposite, because you had AMD with the a with AMD with the APUs, and then you had Intel, who was running circles around the IPC, and now it's now seemingly flipping a little bit with yeah. what they're focusing on. Yeah. Now it looks very interesting, where Intel's all of a sudden the APU company. Yeah. Um, with that said. Um, I mean, when we when we showed Ryzen off back at CES, I just I have to be really careful while I'm talking to not say things that are embargoed. <laughs> so I'm trying to remember when I learned things and whether they're embargoed or not. So you'll remember this from CES. APUs are also coming to the AM4 platform. 
In fact, most AM4 boards have video outputs on the back, even though none of the Ryzen 7 CPUs have any onboard graphics, so those will just be dead ports in that case. Well, will they be, or is, are they integrating any kind of, um, you know, back in the day, they, they would sometimes have little iGPUs that sat directly on the motherboard. I'm guessing nope. they're not doing this anymore. They're though. not doing yeah. that. It's either on the CPU, or APU as it were, mm -hmm. or it is not in the computer. So that's kind of the summary. AMD and the demos look really impressive. There were more demos than what I showed in my video, and if you watch some other people's coverage, they might have focused on different demos, but I was incredibly impressed with the amount of progress that AMD has made over the last four years that Zen Core has been in development. Now, with that set. Oh, you know what? Okay, no, 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 no. A little bit. I, I want to straw pull this. I want to straw pull this. I want to get your take on this. Okay. Um, but, and I'm going to straw pull it before I ask you because someone has pointed out to me in the past that it is like a huge problem to issue a straw pull to the audience. And then say, oh, here's what we think, and then so it skews the poll. And, and say what yeah. we think first. Yeah, okay. So, AMD Ryzen, um, does this mark a return to competition. Yes? No. How are, we, how are we defining competition, like a certain percentage of the market or a certain? I don't think we are, I don't think we're gonna try to define it in black and white necessarily. I just wanna know, in the minds of the viewers, do you feel like we're getting back to a time when there is competition in the CPU market and where you don't feel like Intel is just doing whatever they want, as long as they want, or as short as they want, and we all just kind of have to suck it up, princess. <laughs> so while the results roll in, why don't you go ahead and share your thoughts? So what do we know about uh, about performance levels, like single-threaded performance? Because I've heard rumors, and you have probably learned you have made since I've heard this. I'm not sure how much you can say, but I've heard, oh, so it's going to be similar to what Intel had with Broadwell, and Broadwell's a couple generations old now by this point, but at the same time, if you look at how most users, even a lot of enthusiasts are using their their rigs, they'd be hard pressed to tell the difference between Broadwell and KB right in the day to day. Okay, so, so maybe assume, okay, AMD is not going to take a huge hit because users want more raw single threaded performance. Assume that doesn't happen. Yeah. So, I looked the other night on Amazon, and Ryzen's already like number one selling CPU. Now, granted, not everyone's going out and buying CPU in the box. Vast majority of people they're buying pre built they're buying laptops, whatever. Yeah. But nevertheless, it did make it up to like the top of the best selling charts. Okay. So, um, and you're looking at okay, so we're, it's 2017 now, and we have more and more things that could take advantage of multiple cores, not everything, obviously. Yep. But, but it's a better situation than it was. It's, it's a much better situation than it was. You know, four or five years ago, when Absolutely. Intel said, yeah. look, six cores and more, that's enthusiast. Exactly. So we're getting to the point yeah. now where, you know, those sorts of things that can leverage that stuff is becoming better optimized, has become a little bit more mainstream, and you have, you have a chip here that is eight cores and reportedly 16 threads. We kind of had a discussion about this yes. earlier. Yes, eight and cores, 16 yeah. threads, and mm -hmm. this is, we're not talking bulldozer here, yeah. where AMD was like, yes, we have eight cores, but actually they have four compute modules which share some resources. These are eight cores. They showed die shots. There we go, yeah. These so, are eight cores. Okay, so okay. we have eight actual independent cores that aren't sharing resources as lines just With SMT. Said. And, and you have this, you can get a 3.7 gigahertz chip with this architecture, and yes, you miss out on sort of like, you know, the Intel platform exclusive features, but if we're just talking about performance here, 330 bucks US as opposed to the equivalent chip is like, a, what, about $1,000? So, depending how you measure it, and that's something yeah. that we have to be really careful as the press, that's true. Yeah. and users have to be really careful about as well, we need to make sure that we understand that there are going to be situations mm -hmm. where 7700K is going to kick mm -hmm. a Ryzen 1700's butt. And there are also, also platform features that you would be getting with Intel. I mean, is, what's the, is 40 to 24 as far as the PCI Express Lane situation? So is, is, are my numbers right there? On or? the 7700K, it's 20 to 24. Oh, no, I'm, I'm not talking about yeah. things. I'm talking about, like, uh, because the 7700K is not 8-core. I'm talking about Intel's um, 
Skylake, or oh, see, not Skylake, but a Broadwell, Broadwell E. e. Broadwell yes. E. So in that case, yeah. again, so we have to be yeah. really careful when we compare to the 7700K, which has a much higher clock speed and mm -hmm. will therefore deliver better performance in some applications that are really clock speed or like individual core performance dependent, like some games. So we gotta be careful about that comparison. We can't say the 1700 is hands down better, even if it absolutely spanks it in content creation benchmarks, for example. Mm -hmm. And then we have to be really careful, again, saying, okay, the 1800X is equivalent to a 6900K. Because like John was saying, if you have...